Hey everyone, welcome back to Apologetics. Super pumped to join us today. To have Dr. John Hot with me. We've been talking about Christianity and evolution, and are they friends? Are they enemies? Are they something in between? Dr. Hot, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Zach. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm super pumped for this conversation, and we're going to talk about um, evolution and the problem of evolutionary evil and things like what is evolution? Is evolution random? And just evolution and Christianity, all these fun questions. So. Before we get into that heavy stuff, John, what do you just want to say with like regards to like who you are and what you do? Okay, for many years I taught uh, theology at Georgetown University, and uh, starting around 1970, I developed a course on science and religion, and I taught that course almost every year until I retired in 2005. Uh, since that time, I've uh, had an opportunity to get involved in the science and religion discussions uh, internationally. And at the same time, I've had opportunities to do a lot more publishing. So I've written quite a bit on science and religion in general, but especially on evolution and cosmology and theology. And my question there is, what does the whole complex of new scientific ideas, especially since the 19th century, have to do with a theological worldview. Can we learn anything theologically from the way in which science tells us nature is working? Or do we have to keep science and religion separate so that they cannot really converse with one another? My view is that there should be a conversation between them, but we have to make clear distinctions between science and religion. And we should never let our theology interfere with scientific ideas. We should never edit science so as to conform to our theology, but we should let scientists have their say and then step back and reflect on what it means for faith and for theology that science has now given us these fascinating ideas such as evolution and more recently, uh, cosmology. Mm. So much great stuff and so much fun topics that we're going to explore here as we get going, John. So just to like get things started, a lot of people would think that like something like evolution and Christianity and, and there's atheists and Christians who would think this are just like fundamentally incompatible. So like how would you respond to someone who claims that these two topics are they just don't mesh at all? Well, I, I think we have to look at the complexity of the reasons why people have problems with uh, evolution. And it's not just one reason, there are several reasons. For many people, what's at stake after Darwin is the very existence of a creator, because if life came about in the impersonal way that Darwin and evolutionary biologists tell us it did, then a lot of people wonder, well, what place for a creator? Uh, how can we uh, glorify the idea of God and creation if it all happens either randomly or spontaneously or by impersonal processes. So the larger question that we have to deal with is what is the relationship between divine causality and natural causality? Uh, that's one question. Uh, a lot of people have problems with Darwin and his followers because it seems to interfere with the biblical idea in Genesis that God saw that creation is good. So the goodness of creation is very much at stake for a lot of people if life came about in the cruel and the impersonal way that evolutionary biologists uh, tell it does. So we have to address that question too. Then for many people, and this was especially problematic right after Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, what's at issue is human identity. Who are we? What are we if there are no sharp breaks between human existence and primate existence and uh, previous animal existence? And furthermore, uh, what is the difference between life and matter? Ultimately, the question of evolution comes down to or brings that question into play as well. Then if you're Christian, a fourth issue is what is the meaning of Christ if Darwin is right? Uh, for a lot of Christians, it's the very existence of a savior that seems to be at stake. For example, the founder of Liberty University himself said that if Darwin is right, then there was no original sin. And if there's no original sin, then what place for a savior? 
So that's a question that a lot of people have problems with, too. Maybe we can talk about my response to that as well. Uh, and fifthly, what is the scope of redemption? If, if Christ is a redeemer, what is, what is he redeeming? Uh, what is he healing? Uh, what is the flaw uh, in nature to which the divine savior is a response, a healing response? But in general, the, the underlying question here in all this discussion is what to make of divine providence and divine wisdom in an evolutionary context. What does it mean? Providence means that God provides, that God cares. Can we still speak of a caring God if evolution takes place in the ragged way that Darwin tells us it did? And then the belief in an infinite divine wisdom that underlies the universe. Can we believe in wisdom anymore? As you know, Many followers of Darwin think that Darwin's ideas have destroyed all these ideas once and for all, that it's impossible plausibly to speak of divine providence any longer, and just as implausible to speak of divine wisdom, given the crazy erratic pathway that the story of life has been following. So those are, those are some of the issues. There are many, many different uh, issues other than that, but these are the main ones, I think. And so uh, we, we have to address them. The, the question of a creator uh, is easily addressed by distinguishing between primary causes and secondary causes, that God creates a universe which makes itself. That's a wonderful idea theologically, a God who can make a universe that can itself spontaneously and through its own autonomous operations bring about the wonders of nature and especially life that we see now uh, is much more impressive, much more worthy of our worship than a God who pulls all the strings directly, as some of the advocates of intelligent design seem to suggest, that God has to intervene in nature and stitch amino acids and nucleic acids together in a way to uh, sort of interfere with natural processes. The, the idea that nature uh, is not enough to explain the complexity of matter and complexity of life, that has to be examined very carefully. Maybe God has created a world that's very, very talented, that is autonomously capable of giving rise to, to life and then eventually out of life to humanity and to the fascinating, precious phenomenon of, of freedom. As for the goodness of creation, we have to ask the question, when is creation good? Genesis talks about it in the beginning, <laughs> but we now know from science that the universe is still coming into being. And if the universe is still coming into being, that means it has not yet been perfected. And if it has not yet been perfected, that means there is room for imperfection. And if there's room for imperfection, then evil can gain a foothold in an unfinished universe. So then the question becomes, why would a good God create a universe which has to create itself? Why would a good God hand over to nature the, the process or the objective or the goal of bringing about the stupendous phenomenon of life, first of all, and then of consciousness, of thought, and of freedom, and of our capacity to do good and evil. <clears throat> and uh, ultimately, how could we explain theologically in a Darwinian world uh, why creation is still not good? <clears throat> Maybe it's because goodness corresponds with a completed creation. And since the creation has not yet been completed, then we cannot logically expect perfection from such a universe. So then the question moves, and we can talk about this later on, I won't talk about it now, <clears throat> to the question of why would a good God create a universe which is not finished and perfected? Uh, what happened was that the text, the scriptural texts of our traditions seem to have given us a God who created the universe perfectly in the beginning. And then 
the some culprit came along and messed it all up for us. And so that unleashed the whole history of evil and sin. And that has to be compensated. And the reason, for example, Jerry Falwell uh, rejected evolution is that the whole meaning of Christ is to repair the flaw of sin. So if there was no primordial flaw, as Darwin's science implies, then what is the role of the Savior? What is, what is the meaning of Christ? What is the scope of redemption? And then above all, what do we mean by divine providence and divine wisdom? So those are some of the issues and I'll stop here and let you maybe hone in on something that I've said and we can develop it further. Yeah, this is super helpful and there's so much great stuff to talk about. And I think maybe one thing we can look at before we get into a lot of this interview is we're looking at like the problem of like evolution and evil and understanding like what actually is like evolution. Um, but like for some Christians, they may struggle to get over this hump of, especially like if you grew up in like an American culture where we think that like the world was perfect before Adam's sin in every respect, like no suffering, no death, even from like the lowest of low creatures um, and Adam's sins. And then there's death that enters the world. And obviously like the evolutionary story or like any story, if you grant that the earth isn't like six or 10,000 years old, that's not going to be the case when you look at the fossil record. We're going to see millions of species over millions of years dying and languishing and all these um, these things. So what would you say to someone just like struggling to go over this hump of like trying to understand like how there could even be death before like, so to speak, a fall in the first place? Well, what I have to do is when I taught my course on science and religion at Georgetown is to get the students to realize that the story of life as Darwinian biology tells us it's only part of a much, much larger story, the story of the universe. Now, Darwin himself didn't know this. We didn't know that the whole cosmos that's 13, is a 13.8 billion year old story. We didn't know that until the 20th century. And even Einstein was not quite ready to see the universe as something that, that, that ages across time. Einstein was almost religious in his obsession with timelessness. He himself thought that <clears throat> the whole purpose of science is simply to explore the timeless geometric structure that underlies it. And it was only after some of his fellow scientists, including the Belgian the Roman Catholic priest and physicist Georges Lemaitre, taught, instructed Einstein that his theory of relativity, his general theory of relativity, can entail a universe that's very, very old, that began with a tiny speck of matter and then evolved over the course of almost 14 billion years, and eventually four billion years ago or so brought forth life, and that what we are living in is an incredible drama a drama that I have ultimately thought of as a drama of awakening. And we didn't locate Darwin's theory within the context of that drama. So what I had my students do is imagine they had on their bookshelf 30 big books, 30 big volumes. And each of these volumes is 450 pages long. And each page in each of these 30 volumes stands for 1 million years in a story of our universe. And what's really troubling as you look at this universe theologically for a lot of people, and a lot of religious people don't even want to look at it. It's an abyss for them. They don't want to look into what we call deep time uh, because their religious education has not prepared them well to deal with deep time. So they ignore it altogether and are more content with a 6,000 year old uh, universe. And even uh, trained theologians in all the traditions, I don't think, look deeply into deep time. So let's talk about this deep time because that's gonna be essential for understanding how evolution fits in to nature, to the natural world. These 30 volumes, the first 22 of them, the first 22 of these 450 page volumes, each page standing for a million years, the first 22 volumes are devoid of life and thought. The universe during all those ages was apparently lifeless and mindless. Now that's very troubling for a lot of people, but we'll talk about that later on. Life doesn't come in until volume 22, 3.8 billion years ago. And even then, 
the embers of life do not glow very brightly until you get almost to the end of volume 29 of our 30 volumes. That's when the Cambrian explosion takes place around 570 million years ago. And all of a sudden at that time, of course, over millions of years, life begins to accelerate in its complexification. Matter has to complexify as physicists and chemists tell us to a certain degree of incredible complexity before life can enter uh, into the universe. So all that was going on for 29 volumes was a process of complexification. And even dinosaurs don't come into the story until after the middle of volume 30. The dinosaurs go extinct on page 384, which leaves only the last 66 pages of volume 30 for the development of mammals. And eventually primates come in somewhere between 50 and 100 pages from the end of volume 30. When do humans come onto the scene? When do modern, anatomically modern humans come onto the scene? Descendants of Cro-Magnon humanity. Not until the very bottom of the very last page of the very last volume. It's only then that what we refer to as thought or intelligence, self-awareness, conscious self-awareness uh, as humans have, uh, or ethical aspiration or the quest for meaning uh, come into the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And our religious traditions, including Christianity, don't arise until the very last line of the very last page of the very last volume. So I had my students look at this before we even talked about evolution, about Darwin. Look at this cosmos and ask yourself, what could possibly be going on in this large 30 volume story? And it seems that if you consult scientific and philosophical experts, they'll say something like what uh, Bertrand Russell, the famous uh, atheist and philosopher said when he contemplated this new cosmic story, he asked uh, if the point of this is, is to produce intelligence, then why did it take so long to produce so little? Mm -hmm. So what's going on in the universe has to be coalesced with, has to be merged with the question of what's going on in the life process, what's going on in evolution. And I don't think you can answer the question of what evolution, the evolution of life is about unless you keep reinserting the 3.8 billion years of life back into this larger uh, cosmic story. And then some very, very interesting angles on evolution uh, can show up. Now in the last 10 volumes, it isn't until, oh, I guess volume nine, from the last, the ninth volume from the last, that life comes about. And once life comes about, scientists tell us, and I believe quite rightly, that the Darwinian recipe for evolutionary change in the story of life begins to take over. But let's look at that recipe very carefully. Uh, the formula or the recipe for the Darwinian evolution of life consists of three main ingredients. You need lots of accidents, first of all. Then you need the impersonal mechanism of natural selection, but then you need lots and lots of time for significant changes to take place, such as the evolution of animals and eventually the evolution of ourselves. Time is part of the creative process. And a lot of Christians wonder, well, why if God really wanted life to appear and thought to appear in creation, why would God fool around and fool around for those so many billions of years before letting life come onto the scene? Uh, and that's a real problem for a lot of people. But the way in which I look at it, and we'll get into that a little bit later on, that's not a problem at all. Uh, because I'm going to maintain, and I'll just jump ahead a little bit here, that what we need to do is acknowledge that the universe has a narrative quality about it that Darwin was unaware of and that 
almost all people were unaware of until the early 20th century. And even after the early 20th century, a lot of people doubted the Big Bang cosmology that Einstein's followers formulated very early in the 20th century. In fact, I, I can remember sitting in my office at Georgetown in 1992, getting a call from a radio station which heard that the COBE background satellites, C-O-B-E, uh, piloted by the scientist Edwin Smoot, had discovered that there is indeed a differenti differentiation in the smoking gun of the Big Bang, that is the microwave background radiation that science can now detect, and that that differentiation in wavelengths in the cosmic background, uh, uh, ex that the cosmic background explorer discovered are indications that there were seeds of the development of stars and then eventually everything else that follows already present in the wavelength of the background microwave radiation um, that gives us uh, almost visible smoking gun evidence that there was a Big Bang. And ever since the early 90s, the consensus among scientists has grown that the universe is very old, and they've dated it pretty accurately to 13.8 billion years from what I uh, understand. And that's what we have to work with. That has to be the background. This cosmic story has to be the backdrop of everything we deal with in science and religion. And it's a wonderful background because once you recognize that the universe is a narrative, it's a story, it suggests that there, there are ways in which we can read the story. And I think there are three different ways in which people read this, this story, which eventually brought about life uh, not too long ago, four billion years ago. You can read it materialistically and decide that ultimately everything that's going on in the universe right now is simply the algorithmic working out of what was the nature of the universe at its very beginning. So in order to understand the universe, you go back, you dig back and back until you come to the very first instant of the cosmos. And maybe we can get a sense of what the universe is all about, the more we can uncover the beginning. So there's a lot of stuff like particle accelerators and other stuff going on in science that is committed to the belief that we really can't understand the present universe or anything that happened along these 13.8 billion years that have passed since the beginning, unless we recover, recapture uh, this beginning. So there's a kind of archaeological approach to the universe, which I think takes up the majority of intellectual and academic study of the universe. There's still a second way in which you can look at the story, and that's the traditional theological way. And that's to not, not get too worried about the fact that it's taken so long. Traditional theology, uh, especially in the Middle Ages, uh, began to think that the way in which we have to look at everything in nature is as a symbol or a sacrament, an, an imperfect replica or remembrance of something that takes place in the sphere of eternity of timelessness. And so that the way in which we should live our lives is to look at the natural world, especially its beauties, as revelations of the divine that has been there forever. And a lot of people live their religious lives according to this quite beautiful religious vision that uh, look, look at everything, uh, everything takes on a value, especially human life, if you see it as a reflection of something that was established from all eternity. And so you can lift yourself out of time. You can get yourself out of this river of 13.8 billion years. You can get some respite from the flow if you can allow yourself to be lifted by images of eternity and timelessness. And for a lot of people, that's, this, that's what religion is supposed to do, is to lift us out of the finite, perishable, temporal, material, physical world, which is imperfect, and place us to the extent that we prayerfully approach it in the sphere of eternity. And I don't want to be critical of that 
understanding of religion. I can understand why when people did not yet know the story of life and its larger cosmic context, thought of their religious life as something that rescues us from the turmoil of time and gives us peace. And most Christians still, I think, think sort of that way uh, about God and about Christ. Their, their contact with the Savior lifts them out of this mess, a sinful mess that we find ourselves in, or at least promises to do so. So we live in hope that that promise will be fulfilled. So this way of understanding faith uh, does not really engage. It's not really interested in engaging the new story of nature that science has been telling us. First, geology back in the late 18th century, then evolutionary biology with Darwin, which unfroze life and put it in a stream of, of uh, animate becoming. And then more recently, it's allowed people, this analogy, this traditional theological view has allowed people to ignore the Big Bang theory as not having any consequences for our religious life. Now, what I've done and what I've thought about over many years of teaching science and religion is that there's an alternative approach. And I confess that not too many people have taken this approach. I learned it from a Jesuit priest, a paleontologist, a geologist named Teilhard de Chardin. His name is usually referred to as Teilhard, that's T-E-I-L-H-A-R-D. And what he thought, since he was a paleontologist and a geologist and therefore an evolutionist, is that we can revamp Christian thought and Christian piety so that we pay attention to the fact that we are part of a cosmic stream. And that means that uh, our whole sense of who we are, our whole sense of what life is, instead of looking back as the materialist view does, and instead of looking upward as the traditional theological and religious view uh, does, we can go back to Abraham. And so I consider my thought very Abrahamic, very biblical, and concentrate on the question, what is coming? from up ahead. And that to me is the most important question we can ask. And um, Darwin and other scientists have already, already shown us that at any point, if you go back to the beginning of the universe, when it was just a plasma of subatomic particles, how many of us, if we had looked at that monotonous sea of radiation, would have predicted that out of that would eventually come cells, living organisms, and eventually organisms capable of thought, organisms like humans capable not only of thought, but of living a good life, of responding to infinite goodness. How many of us would have predicted that out of that plasma would come people like yourself, uh, who are asking questions about the meaning of it all. This is a really fascinating story that we live in, but we've ignored it because we haven't realized until recently that the whole cosmos is an awakening. And that's my main point here, that the, the whole cosmic story turns out to be a fascinating narrative or drama of awakening. And the proof of that is the fact that you and your listeners are all listening to me, trying to make sense of what I'm saying. They're trying to understand what I'm saying, but even more, they're trying to, they're asking the question of whether what I'm saying is true. So the fact that your listeners and you and all of us are somehow in the grasp of this value of truth makes the whole universe, which has led up to you and me, of which we are fully a part, it makes the whole universe a story of awakening to meaning, uh, to truth, and also, if we think about it, to goodness, and perhaps above all, to beauty. Notice the way in which we are all carried away by beauty. Uh, and 
if you see the universe as an awakening to all of these things, then the story of life is not so annoying as it might otherwise seem to be. If you concentrate just on a Darwinian recipe, lots of accidents plus natural selection plus lots of time, and reflect on that recipe itself, what are the, the three ingredients of accident or contingency or randomness plus laws like natural selection and the laws of physics and time what is that that's the stuff of story that's the stuff of drama so this universe that we live in especially once it gives rise to life which is a is the story of struggle that comes into what previously had been a rather inanimate universe that that world itself turns out to be a world of anticipation and so the anticipation of truth goodness and beauty that you feel in your mind and your listeners feel in their mind right now that's the cosmos you're not something outside of the universe you're part of the universe so through you the universe is reaching out toward deeper awakening and to me that gives a value to the cosmos that we hadn't noticed before so that's the context in which I want to talk about the story of life as well. Yeah, that's super helpful. And thank you for really taking time to go through that. Um, so looking at like the question of evolution, then obviously like people like Charles Darwin or like Stephen Jay Gold have seen evolution as like this purely random process where if you wind the clock back, um, who knows what we'd end up with? Maybe something completely different than what we got now. Um, but you talk about this idea of like evolution being more of this narrative with like a story like structure. Do you want to kind of like elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by this? Yes, I don't want to get into the idea, which to me seems to be theologically problematic, <clears throat> that somehow God comes down and enters into the natural process and tweaks it so that it's oriented this way or, or that. I don't have to do that because the ultimate horizon of the whole cosmic story is what I call infinite indestructible rightness. And I use the term rightness to stand for all the great ideals and values that have become explicit in the consciousness of human beings, but which were somehow silently operative from the very beginning of the cosmos. So I would say that the, the, whole, the whole universe from the very beginning was in the process of a kind of pre-dawn awakening. And what, what we've learned from astrophysics in the 20th century is that the history of matter before life and thought came onto the scene is much more fascinating, uh, much more congenial to the eventual arrival of life and mind in the universe than we had thought before the 20th century. We used to think that the cosmos, the material world, was basically lifeless and meaningless, and that therefore the scum of life accidentally attached itself to this rock that we live on uh, four billion years ago, and that that's why we feel a bit strange here. But I, I used to use a book in my course uh, at Georgetown on science and religion, uh, which was popular back in the late 60s and 70s. It was by a French biologist named Jacques Manot. <clears throat> and Jacques Manot, I wrote this book called Chance and Necessity, in which he reduced the whole phenomenon of life to a purely random event, which by absolutely unplanned accident attached itself to Earth. And that's why we feel strange here. Uh, and, and that little by little, by purely natural processes, it evolved and became by chance <coughs> incorporated into DNA and the nucleic acids <coughs> and amino acids. And as a result, life, the story of life got started. Mm -hmm. But since the 1970s, when I first started teaching at Georgetown, the whole nature of physics has changed, and especially astrophysics. We learned in especially around 1950s that carbon was not there at the beginning. The carbon, which is absolutely essential for life, 
only came into the universe much later on. But the possibility of there being carbon depended upon the existence of there being massive stars, which were hot enough in their core to cook the primordial hydrogen and helium, helium into carbon and other elements which are essential for life. But we can't take carbon for granted anymore. We have to go all the way back to the first microsecond of the universe. Many scientists like Freeman Dyson uh, tell us, so this is science, I'm not making this, I'm making this stuff up. Science physicists themselves say that at the beginning, the ratio of to proton mass, the ratio of the weak to strong nuclear force, but especially the rate of cosmic expansion and the rate of the force of the gravitational coupling constant had to be uh, very narrowly, uh, they would say, fine-tuned. And I don't want to bring in a, a design argument at this point, but it had to fall within parameters that would allow life and mind eventually to develop, to develop down the road. So whether you talk about this fine-tuning as divine or just natural, <clears throat> I don't need to get into that right now. What we do know is that the awakening that's going on in this present moment between you and me and your listeners would never have occurred apart from precise physical mathematically precise precision that uh, uh, that ha happened at the very beginning of the cosmos. So what that means to me, whether you interpret it theologically or not, is that our universe has always been a process of awakening. Now, I don't want to put the awakener back then. I want to put the awakener up ahead. The way in which God creates the universe is not from out of the past, but by calling it into an unknown and unprecedented and new uh, future. So that's my view of the universe. It's the awakening takes place not because of the physics, but because there is an indestructible horizon of rightness at the future dawning of creation up ahead. And that that would be a factor in my interpretation, which I call anticipatory. The first one I called materialist. The second was otherworldly. The approach that I use in my theology, I call anticipatory. And I have a couple books coming out in the future. One of them is called The Cosmic Vision of Teilhard de Chardin, and another one which will appear in March called God After Einstein in which I developed my theological anticipatory view of the universe. So I locate God not so much up above or back in the past, but up ahead, a God who calls the universe, but doesn't force it. And here's the key to my evolutionary theology. The God who is awakening the universe does not coerce it, does not force it. God is not a dictator. And here I bring my own Christian vision into the picture. God is a God of love. In order to understand God, Christians are instructed not to think about God without thinking about the man Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what do we find in the man Jesus? We find the incarnation, the entering into our history of an infinite divine love. And that infinite divine love is still alive, still around, uh, operating not just uh, on ourselves and our inward life, but on this whole universe, still calling the universe into a, a new future, but not forcing it. And if God does not force, then the universe has room, has scope for experimentation, for meandering around, for trying things out, for, for having reached dead ends at times, but which can start over and which science has shown it has done. For example, we've had five major extinctions of life on planet Earth. But it seems that there's something about the nature of physical reality that allows for reawakening uh, to take place. So this awakening is the, the metaphor that I use for God, not cause, not creator uh, in the sense of molding clay, but creator in the sense of letting be. And that letting be allows for the randomness in evolution, and it allows for the freedom 
that takes place in human existence as well. So we don't live in a deterministic universe, as materialists say. Uh, ultimately, I, I think I could show that the materialism is incoherent because what, what materialism implies is that ultimately everything is reducible to mindless and lifeless atoms and molecules. But the people who are saying that are using their minds and they're trusting their minds to be able to give us the truth about things. So I don't think you can have a cognitive trust, at least coherently, unless you have a worldview that justifies the trust you have in your own mind. Materialism cannot justify the trust that you have in your own mind. Whereas the anticipatory universe that I'm talking about, in which I locate the evolution of life, as well as the emergence of human freedom, uh, that universe, because it relies upon something indestructible emerging on the horizon of the future, uh, allows you to justify the trust you have in your mind because it's that indestructible truth and uh, rightness that has allowed you to awaken to consciousness in the first place. So it's a complete, what we need, uh, to put it simply, is a completely different worldview from what is now applicable and adhered to by most American and British philosophers and by materialist scientists. We need to get away from materialism if we're going to justify the confidence we have in our own minds, which is the way in, in which the universe is now awakening uh, to its future. And I fit evolution, the evolution of life, within that larger cosmic drama, this drama of awakening uh, that we refer to as the universe. So the, so you see, I, I can't really address the questions of evolution unless I, first of all, construct the cosmology. And this is what my books, uh, the forthcoming books, are, are, are trying to do, to give readers a sense of what, of the anticipatory quality of the cosmos uh, we live in. And that view makes room for science. There's nothing in my worldview that contradicts anything in science, but it also makes room for faith as well that's so interesting and thank you for kind of working through this john because it's so important to like kind of frame the context of these issues um my next question for you is like it's been described of your view of evolution to something akin to like we have this like tragic beauty of god who um is using this universe and ordering it um and bringing something beautiful out of it and using an evolutionary process to do this um so like do you think there's sort of like maybe like aesthetic goods that can come from god using like an evolutionary story uh, yes, but I don't want to make it seem as though uh, God intended the tragedy and the evil and the contrast and the messiness that takes place. I think what God intends, what God aims for is beauty. And uh, got this idea and developed it starting from reading the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. So Whitehead is known as a process philosopher, and there's a whole school of Christian theology <clears throat> which uses Whitehead's thought as the intellectual framework for understanding the meaning of Christ as well as the meaning of God. And what his thought allows for uh, is not that God determines or wants the universe to fall into evil, but once it has fallen, because God wants the universe to experiment with different possibilities. And some of these possibilities are dead ends. And if God allows for freedom, God allows for monstrous evil as well. But uh, that doesn't mean that God is indictable uh, for evil and suffering. What I think of when I think of God is the the ultimate synthesis of harmony and contrast, of multiplicity and unity. The definition of evil, I mean of, of, of beauty rather, that Whitehead gives us is the harmony of contrast. So what's happening is that in the life of God, in, in God's own life, God in process thinking, process theology, is continually synthesizing into the divine life a, a combination of contrast and harmony, of multiplicity 
and unity. And that synthesis, it's that synthesis of harmony and contrast that is his definition of beauty. If you have just harmony, which is what we humans would like the universe to be, then that's monotony. That's not beauty. If you have just contrast or multiplicity, that's chaos. But if you have a harmony of contrasts, then you have a beauty which can grow, which can become maximized. And that's what I consider the universe to be, the, uh, the effect of or the result of a maximization of harmony and contrast, uh, which will not be completed or completely finished, if you will, except in within the life of God. So that everything that takes place in the evolution of life, including the massive amount of suffering and struggle that takes place there, and the suffering of human beings as well, that's all part of this cosmic awakening to beauty. But since the awakening is still not complete, beauty is not yet complete. And this is why, as I said earlier, the, the question is, is when does the universe become good? If, and that's the same as asking, when does the universe become completely beautiful? Uh, clearly, not yet. But at least there's room for hope here. In some sense, God, uh, in a very qualified sense, we can think of God as somehow not yet. Uh, because the universe that God loves is somehow not yet. But if God is not yet, then there's plenty of room for hope. Uh, it's not the same as the materialist acquiescence in cosmic pessimism. It's not the traditional theological notion of salvation as escape from the universe into a timeless heaven. It's the idea of a universe which still has a universe which can be continually synthesized by the love and compassion of God. And the word compassion is fundamental to my theology of the cosmos, uh, as it was uh, to Whitehead's uh, philosophy of nature. Mm. So helpful. Thank you, John. I have one more question for you before we wrap up here. And we've hinted at this a lot, but we have this question of like evolutionary evils. So a lot of people and like some Christians who struggle with evolution and a lot of atheists will say that if we're looking at like the idea of like a perfect God creating universe, like it's really surprising to see that there'd be this, um, he'd use this process involved suffering and death over millions of years with predation and these five mass extinction events. So like, how would you respond to those people who claim that like evolutionary evils and suffering and death would count against, um, count as evidence against the existence of God? Very briefly, I tell them to think, what's your alternative? Uh, if you were God, what kind of universe would you create? Imagine that you're God, and some people find that easier to do than others. <laughs> but imagine that you are God. What kind of universe would you have created? Would you have created one that's perfectly rounded off and complete? If you did, such a universe would not be distinct from God. It would be like an appendage of the divine will. It would not have independence or autonomy to it. It would not be a world. So a perfectly finished world or perfected world at the beginning, a completed, an initially completed universe would not have a future because everything would be finished. It would not have freedom because everything would be put in its place from the very beginning. So the precious realities of freedom and life, there would be no life either because in order for life to exist, there has to be the possibility of self-transcendence, of going beyond yourself and bringing new possibilities into your existence, which is risky and adventurous, but it's much better than being frozen forever into a fixed perfection that has no future. So that, think of those the alternatives. If you want a perfect universe, don't uh, you, you might get what you're asking for, but it's not what you really want. Some of my own reflections, like thinking about, like I guess, is the problem even more generally. Like it seems like, a, like if God's going to create a universe, it's better for, uh, say, like humans like us um, or other species to like overcome evil rather than there just be like no evil in the first place. So it just seems better. Um, and honestly, expected there would be some evils um, if God exists. You have to look into the future. You have to look into the long run of things. We're not conditioned to do that, <clears throat> and that's why I reject the materialist view. 
which tries to explain <coughs> everything in terms of <coughs> the laws and particles that existed in the beginning, uh, going back, that's not a really very interesting worldview. Mm -hmm. uh, nor do I want to accept a theological view in which we have to get away from the universe and nature in order to find God. <clears throat> That's not satisfactory either. What I propose is a universe which still, which is still coming into being. Mm -hmm. And if it's still coming into being, uh, you can't expect it to be perfect. And you can't even find it fully intelligible because a universe that's still coming into being is not even real yet. Uh, so let alone fully intelligible. <clears throat> so you, we look for intelligibility, not by going to the past or not by going to some eternal world above, but by looking toward the future. And um, and you can make sense of that if, if you recognize, you just follow your own life, how things that you didn't understand earlier in your life become more intelligible as you move toward the future. Why don't we apply that same logic or at least experiment with that same logic when we refer to the cosmos? But that's why I don't wanna talk about evolution of life without putting it in the context of an unfinished universe. Mm -hmm. An unfinished universe has a future. A finished universe does not. An unfinished universe makes room for what St. Paul called hope and which is the fundamental virtue in Christianity. Christianity is fundamentally a religion of hope. But if you have your cosmology constricted in such a way as not to have any room for hope, then you either take premature mystical excursions into the beyond and just leave the universe behind, or you reduce the whole universe to laws and, and inanimate particles which is not very interesting either, or you open yourself to an open future in which newness keeps coming into the universe. And that opens you to the biblical understanding of God. The God of Abraham is a God who makes all things new. The God of Abraham is one who calls not only Israel, not only the people of God, not, not even all the earth, but a God who calls the whole universe into a new future. And that that allows us to transplant the hope that we've learned from the Bible onto the whole universe. So my view, I, I think, is fully biblical. In fact, much more biblical than traditional Christianity. And I would defend the biblical foundations uh, that have inspired me to this anticipatory worldview, which has the advantage of also allowing science and faith to coexist in complete harmony. That's so helpful. So thank you so much, Dr. Hot, for coming on today. Do you have any kind of like last thoughts or things you want to say before we wrap up here? Keep hope alive. There's room for it. <laughs> uh, we live in a world in which there is always room for a new future. If we didn't have such a universe, then hope uh, would be quenched, would be snuffed out. But uh, we have graciously given to us, I think by God, an open universe, a universe in which the future is always open and which therefore there's room for hope. And without hope, we cannot fully love because what is love? Love is making a future for your beloved. But if there's no room for a future, there's no room for hope and there's no room for love either. So ultimately, I'm affirming the traditional values of faith, hope, and love, and the imitation of Christ as the worldview that we can live by, and that we can live by it without feeling in the slightest that we're contradicting Darwin and Einstein and other scientists. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Dr. Hart, for coming on. You do have new books coming out, like The Cosmic Vision of Tahar de Chardin and God After Einstein, which are going to explore these issues more in more detail. So thank you so much for your time. So grateful. Thank um, you. Yeah, Thanks. one last. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. And to everyone tuning in today, thank you so much for your time. We wish you the best. Um, if you're new to the channel, always you to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. If you enjoy our content, consider becoming a patron or a member. And you think that helps a lot. But yeah, one last time, Dr. Hot, thank you so much. So grateful for this conversation. So much good stuff to think about. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, everyone. God bless.